before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. I think that if art is worth writing about, there's always a point of mystery about it. <laughs> and it's finding that point that, that interests me. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. These days, with everything upended by the ongoing pandemic, some people might be wondering, why does art matter so much in this crazy world of ours? This is a question that the legendary art critic Peter Sheldahl has been asking and answering for years. Born in Fargo, North Dakota in 1942, Sheldahl has been an art critic since the mid-1960s and has spent the past 22 years at the New Yorker magazine, where he's valiantly defended the notions of beauty and authenticity in art against the relentless forces of cynicism and the ersatz. He has published several volumes of postmodern poetry, as well as books of his criticism, most recently in last year's remarkable collection, Hot, Cold, Heavy, Light. This past year has been an unspeakably difficult time for Sheldahl who was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer last September, and then endured a fire at his home of 47 years that destroyed all of his papers. Miraculously, his cancer has since gone into remission, just in time for a COVID-19 pandemic to throw the world into lockdown. Throughout it all, Sheldahl has held fast to his unshakable faith in art, writing movingly about its consolations in The New Yorker, and more recently, about the enduring power of the old masters in times of crisis. For this week's episode of The Art Angle, Artnet News Chief Art Critic Ben Davis sat down with Peter Sheldahl, via Zoom of course, to talk about art's value in times of trouble, among other things. This, I should mention, is a rare treat for listeners. In a survey ranking the world's most influential art critics, Sheldahl came in at number four, Ben at number five. Let's hear what they have to say. So I'm here talking with uh, Peter Sheldahl, who is one of the most respected art critics in the world. And it's a great honor to, to get a chance to, to talk to him. Peter, where, where are you right now? I'm in a, a little town in the Catskills called Bovina. Uh, we have a house in a mountain valley up here where we've been, we've been coming up here for 40 some years. And now we are, I guess, uh, permanent residents. Sure, you're 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 stuck up there. We're all stuck in in place. Sort of the world is frozen in place. Uh huh. I thought I'd just start with the most basic general interest question: How did you end up as an art critic? The way everybody used to, by accident. I grew up in uh, small towns in the Midwest. Went to college, dropped out of college. This is the early sixties. Uh, managed by very strange luck to get a job as a newspaper reporter in Jersey City. Uh, And I was a poet, and I got into the poetry world in Manhattan. So starting in 1965, I started writing for Art News because all the poets wrote art criticism in those days. Uh, Poet critic was kind of the big, the main model of of being a critic then. Well, I mean, it was... uh, barely a professional designation. I mean, nobody went to school for it. New York magazines, you know, wanted people who could write, you know, and I had never taken an art course. I was have a high school diploma. It was my highest achievement, but it took. And here it is, uh, what, 55 years later. You, did you approach it as like a poetic project to begin with? Well, art is an attitude toward materials. My material is language. Mm-hmm. I got very excited, you know, as in New York in the 60s. Everything was happening. And uh, we didn't sleep very much. Uh, and I went everywhere, saw everything, and made every conceivable mistake. And then met our various destinies. You know, I, I you say everything was happening. And I guess my question is, did, did it feel like that when you were there? Do you know that when it's happening? Oh, no, I think we knew. I think it was like, it was a sense that um, we were uh, an incredibly lucky generation. You know, we were right on time. But um, when Andy Warhol started being mentioned in gossip columns, like in the New York Post, 
I started clipping them out, you know, because they were signs of something happening in the wider culture. Until one day, you know, with a needle lawnmower, it exploded. Uh, yeah, you couldn't escape Warhol. Well, it was, you know, it was in the tail end of abstract expressionism, which was a kind of national triumph, right, following the victory in the Second World War. It was the Kennedy years, and there was an arrogance that just seemed unarguable. Uh, as this Midwestern kid from small towns, I thought I had been elevated to the court. In fact, the very first column included in your recent book is this 1989 essay about Andy Warhol, and it's a review of Warhol's show, but it's also a personal narrative about your first encounter with Warhol's flower paintings and how your rapturous reaction to them basically called you into a life in the New York art world. And that is very striking because Warhol's an artist that I think I associate, I think probably most people associate with a certain kind of cool, with surfaces, with a certain deadpan sensibility, but not maybe rapturous, transformative, life-changing depths of feeling. No, no. He was an artist of cunning genius. Uh, but it, it, was, it was a social historical phenomenon. And he sized up what the culture was and where it was going and became uh, the laureate of it. You know, it, was, it was revelatory. His relation to painting, first of all, he was a great painter. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in a, in a way that, like everything about him, was almost incredibly efficient. He understood abstract expressionism, and what he did was uh, essentially take the format of Barnett Newman and uh, put Elvis Presley on it. You know, <laughs> boom. Uh, one-stop shopping, particularly at the earlier painting, you know, the early 60s. I mean, they're sublime. You know, you walk into a room with them and you are riveted and pleased and excited. Um, I mean, you know, intellectually, we we still had the overhang of the Depression and also the the whole debate of high versus low, of serious culture versus trivia. And those distinctions simply didn't exist for Andy because, and this is the analysis that I made, which it seems so obvious, is that he came from the bottom of society, from lower, you know, working class, and right. actually zoomed to the top. You know, there was nothing even remotely middle class about Andy Warhol. And what he beamed from the top were the sorts of things that he had grown up with. Tabloids, movie stars, uh, grocery store consumerism, uh, and when people were looking for the irony, there, Andy Warhol had, had no irony. Right, right. Irony, irony is a breathing apparatus for us middle class nicks because we're subject to conflicts on every level. You know, it's a complicated life, but his his life was always simple. He was really, really poor, and then it was a you know little few years of. Uh, precarious, and then he was really, really rich. And he understood both conditions without bothering to have an opinion about them. I'm sort of just now putting it together, but it is like, when I read that essay and, and think of how it kind of surprises me in a way, and it, it's, it, yeah, it's this question of irony. I feel like that's real key for you, that that a lot of the things you dislike are, are, are things that are kind of bracketed and arch. And, uh, oh, yeah. No, I mean, I guess I'm interested in authenticity of, and it's always a surprise I mean when something's authentic it's, you, you can't plug it in to something that's already there you've got to, got to rearrange things to make room for it I think the classic Peter Sheldahl formula is that you start by setting the scene of the show that's happening now you pass through biography there'll be some informed skepticism about the heroic character of the artist both to inform a sense of what's going on and also to set off the assessment of the object from museum myth-making. And then there's some assessment of the relative quality of specific works or bodies of work. 
which brings you back to description of your own subjective experience and your relationship to the art personally. And you arrive through that at an observation or thought about what it means in the world right now. And that all happens fast in the space of about 1,800 words. Well, it's a, it's a kind of, I mean, I do regard what I do as a species of literature, but it's art criticism that comes after the art. It's a form of writing and it engages me and that I found I could bring a lot of different stuff into. Uh, in terms of the personal, being abysmally ignorant, you know, and uh, self-educating, um, I think I quickly understood that the only thing in the world in which I am the world's leading expert is my experience. So the pronoun I came in pretty early. Something that I really notice when I read a lot of your writing back to back is that there's a lot of embodied description in it. Art is always making you want to slap your forehead or flee the room. And it really strikes me that you're not just talking about what the art does, but what the art does to you. I mean, that's something I'm thinking about. We're all isolated with the coronavirus is that uh, deprived of physical contact with each other and of free-ranging physical contact with the world, it is a very dire to uh, spiritual condition and consequence. Yeah. And one thing I've always fastened on, particularly painting and sculpture for, is that they are physical. They are literal. They are material, as we are. Mm -hmm. And a proper experience of them is in person, as a body to body. I mean, pa painting is, is the exercise of our most powerful sense, which is sight, and our greatest physical aptitude, which is the hand. It's the hand and eye connecting through an object. And, and being in that situation, that's why I use the first person, because I'm, I'm really telling a story of my presence in that situation. Uh, it's not a matter of authority, it's a matter of exposure. It's a slightly different way than, than maybe um, people get trained to write about art, which is sort of yeah. um, almost like a third-person narration. I think that if art is worth writing about, there's always a point of mystery about it. And it's finding that point that, that interests me. I, I write very little negative criticism, except, uh, except when the occasion seems to demand it. In a way, the idea of first-person-driven, writerly art criticism went against the grain of the times you were coming up in as an art critic in the sense that that was when art criticism in general became more academic and more theory-driven. Uh, I was untrained. You know, I was naive. I didn't know that, how to do that stuff. And uh, I found out how I like to write by what people like to read of what I wrote. And uh, to have a career as an artist or, or a writer is, is a collaboration with your audience. I mean, you, you form each other. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, there was a reformation of art. Like, it needs to be severe and this kind of break with the poetic dimension. Well, that was, that was like, the, you know, I, I think I arrived just before that kicked in. Uh, in the middle 60s, you know, it was minimalism. Uh, so I still had a little bit of connection to the, to the romantic. Which, by the way, I think romanticism is the default setting of Western cultural minds. And to the such an extent that we don't even realize it. You know, the kind of minimalist, heavy... I remember, well, I remember going to Max's Kansas City. And uh, the minimalist hung out and front in the around the bar and were really dour and kind of scary and the Warhol people were in back and I, I said it was like walking through heavy metal to get to strawberry shortcake and I would go to the Warhol people even even though I mean I don't feel like I don't feel like I've ever fed in anywhere with any group and uh, not because I didn't want to I just it's not my temperament one thing I really appreciate in your writing is that you don't begin from the premise that much of anything in art has been settled. Yeah, there are big questions about art that it's always assumed that they've been answered. 
and that uh, we can just move on. But in fact, art keeps raising absolutely essential, existential, metaphysical questions that are never settled. And, and something interesting happens in art because one of those questions is being brought back to life. I guess I, you know, a, I have a combination of romanticism and skepticism, which uh, like a tag team. Yeah, a tag team. I mean, I, I highlighted this passage in your essay about uh, Vincent Van Gogh, I think from 1987, where you say, um, oh, lighten up, Vincent. I felt at times. It's only art. <laughs> you know? It's a game. It's a game. We're not, we're not hearing cancer. We're not, we're not establishing world peace. We're not uh, spreading justice through the world. You know, it's, uh, it's entirely subjective weirdly institutionally framed, commercially embedded uh, relation with stuff. I think it's quite remarkable what kind of experience and knowledge and wisdom can emerge from that. But if you go in on your knees with reverence, you're not going to get a thing. You know, I mean, I can walk up to art and see if I can't destroy it, if I can't, you know, sink it to nothing. And then if I can't do that, things get interesting. With my best effort to be a skeptic and a cynic fail, then we can sit down and talk. There's a passage in one of the things you write about the artist and the critic. You say, closeness is impossible between an artist and a critic. Each wants from the other something. The artist's mojo, the critic's sagacity that belongs strictly to the audience for their respective work. And I guess I really identified with that. It's something I discovered through hard experience. I mean, when I was starting, I thought my basic emotional drive was to get close to artists and, you know, kind of worship at their shrines. Mm -hmm and be their friends, and, you know, and, and, and I was. I mean, I had a lot of friendships. But none of them lasted. Just I hung out with artists, drank with artists, slept with artists, and uh, it always led to what we've come to uh, call a codependent collapse. I mean, basically, they didn't have available to me what I wanted, and I didn't have available to them what they wanted. So eventually we fell apart. It's a funny thing that there are these distinct roles and fundamentally different ways of looking at art that are in conflict and even have to be in tension if everything is working right. But at the same time, it's the sense of a community, the sense that there is a scene that draws a lot of artists and writers to art in the first place. If you don't come up through a scene... You're never going to be anything but a hack or an academic. I mean, even the sort of disasters and upsets and disappointments that attend, you know, life in a scene, that is prime information. And if, if, you, if, if you haven't lived it, you don't have it. I mean, it, it constitutes sophistication, right? Knowledge you can click up on Google, but sophistication is distilled from experience. Well, this does bring us back to the idea of the first-person embodied way of thinking about art that we talked about earlier. And that does bring up another thought for me, which is that you are a notoriously readable writer, and that has to do both with the beauty of your language, but also with the sense of personal stakes that you invest in art. But I think that that lyrical and personal dimension can lead some people to underestimate or overlook the fact that I think that there is actually a theory underlying the way you approach um, your subject. And it has to do with, I think you approach art not with a jaded eye, but with uh, uh, an unsparing sense of human nature or artist nature and a sense for piercing through some of the romantic mumbo-jumbo around art, but as a method, as a way of passing through that to the sense of art or looking at art as a kind of wisdom, definitely not a general wisdom, but a quirky, specific, important way of looking at the world. When I say a little frivolously, you know, that you know, I try not to take art too seriously, I am very goddamn serious about what I do. Mm-hmm. I'm very serious about the writing. 
you know, and it can't only sound good, you know. It has to have some actual thought in it. And it's uh, and it's never a thought that I had before I started the piece, you know. It's, uh, it's a, a process of feeling and thinking until I can't think of how to make it any better. You know, here we are in this crazy moment, and uh, I'm not... I'm not a big fan of, you know, the art and coronavirus essay kind of piece, but I, I did appreciate this most recent essay you wrote of uh-huh. Mortality and the Old Masters. Uh, uh-huh. And I mean, I just thought it had a really organic way of uh, uh-huh. wrestling. Thank you. That was, uh, that was easy to write. It only took me about a month of daily agonies. Uh, <laughs> I guess one of the mixed blessings that you got a lot of time to do things. And of course, I had had, uh, it's been quite been a, quite a year for me, you know, and uh, the fall I was diagnosed with lung cancer and given almost no time to live. And I wrote about that. And then uh, the treatment has been a miracle. And then my wife and my apartment of 47 years on St. Mark's Place burned out with a fire. So I don't know. Uh, everything seems to be encouraging me to think about deep, dark things. <laughs> and uh, and then I did have that chance in December of going to going to Madrid uh, and spending days in the Prado, which is my favorite place. Have you always had that kind of connection with old master paintings? You know, I didn't get Rembrandt until I was close to 40. You know, I think most people don't. You have to have lived, you know, because it's, a, it's about you know, the residue of of the content of of being alive. And when you're a kid, you don't know anything about that. And my thing about the old masters, first of all, I knew nothing about them. And I saw their work before I knew anything about them. The the frick was terrific. In the 60s, uh, it was free. They'd walk in any time. There are generally very few people there. There are no labels. It's the artist's name, right? So I fell in love with these paintings one after another before I knew anything about Vermeer or Rembrandt or Veronese. You just went in blind? Yeah. Look at the pictures. I mean, you know, that's that's what you do. You know, and then if you're excited, then you learn, right? And then you're driven to learn. And then if you have to write about it, of course you're going to learn. I like to say that uh, most of what I know about art history was uh, learned on deadlines. Yeah, yeah. I identified with that so, too. I think it's a great way to learn because... Uh, you end up with no excess knowledge. You go to school and they screw off the top of your head and they pour all this stuff in it, right? And you don't know whether it's going to come in handy or not. But in my situation, it was like, uh, I know things because they came in handy, because I needed them right then. And um, But the thing about the old masters is you can't use them up, right? You can keep going back to them, and uh, <clears throat> and as you know, modern art and modernism kicks in, and the world speeds up, you get things that wear out a lot faster. You know, since the '60s, it's like uh, American artists have uh, have you know become disposable napkins. Really interesting for like you know six months. Um, which, by the way, I, I don't sneeze at. I, you know, I'm not against fashion. I think fashion is, is a, a device, it's an apparatus for living in the moment and uh, not to be taken seriously at all, except that it's it's like a, a mechanism of what we're paying attention to at the moment, yeah. right? And if we didn't have it, we'd have to know everything all the time. It's like a spotlight that's shifting. I mean, to become fashionable is to be doomed, you know? Well, I was homeschooled, you know? And I remember when, oh, yeah. I, when I started high school, I remember like having this vivid feeling that like all the other kids um, had this secret language, you know, of like pop culture yeah, references sure. and stuff. And so I yeah. th- always think that that's one feature of culture that it just connects you to other people. You know, like that's the kind of fashion. Well, the, the, that's, that's the whole thing of culture. Culture is the answer to a what we're doing here, you know, and how we can be together. It's the how of uh, existence. And, uh, you know, it had better be fun. 
if that makes sense. The, the reading of modernism that you just mentioned, of, of, you know, that time speeds up and art changes, I feel like that's the pretty normal reading. What I hadn't heard is from this most recent essay, you make this point about the experience of mortality. The passing of a fashion is like a little death, a little bit of death, you know, uh, and the necessity really of uh, a critic when he or she is young, which I am not anymore, uh, is uh, to be where things are happening so as not to miss things that are going to be short-lived. I mean, there are things that have a lot of juice and drama and comedy in them that aren't going to last a year, you know, that will be forgotten. You've got to be there. I think there's a fair amount of that in, in my writing of, of catching things when they're hot. I was wondering if, you know, I, I kept coming back to, you wrote this essay called The Art of Dying about your diagnosis last yeah, year. Yeah, it was, it was terrific. I started writing it after I got my diagnosis. And I didn't know what I was writing. It was it was really like going back thirty five years being a poet. You know, it was. Uh, uh, I didn't think I'd publish it. I didn't know what the hell it was. You know, but thinking that I'm dying, uh, you know, I realized it immediately what the gift was is that I could step out of myself. Right, I could. I'm summing up this character. You know, who I know happen to know quite a bit about. Um, and also, I wanted to do jokes. I was, I was collecting death jokes for a while. And my daughter, Ada, at one point read the draft and said, Dad, too many rim shots. You know, take them out. Um, uh, and, and then when the treatment kicked in and it became clear that I was going to survive, uh, I couldn't write it anymore. I guess I did want to ask you about one paragraph that stood out to me because the whole essay is sort of like Peter Sheldahl writing a Peter Sheldahl essay about Peter Sheldahl. There's a turn through a biography and there are reflections on what it all means and there's even some unsparing assessment and, and, and evaluation in there. But this one paragraph I think did stand out to me because... Again, it was a reflection a little bit on on method and, and the, the theory underneath it all. You say, I retain but suspend my personal taste to deal with the panoply of the art I see. I have a trick for doing justice to an uncongenial work. What would I like about this if I liked it? I may come around, I may not. Failing that, I wonder, what must the people who like this be like? Anthropology. And that was the, that that word anthropology. What does that mean? Oh, the thing about the thing about what I like if I like this. Is, I realized I was doing that. I mean, it's like you know, otherwise, what am I? I'm a, I'm a judge. You know, in the course of writing, being a critic, I'm writing about a lot of things I don't like very much, mm-hmm. but I don't think they're chopped liver, and they mean something to somebody, and that's interesting. So it's like I've, I kind of make myself a lawyer for this stuff. Uh, and see where that goes. You know, Damien Hurst, I'm, I'm hopeless. I, I, I absolutely end up thinking, who the fuck likes this? But also, you know, I also said in there that I have uh, the two main criteria of quality and significance. You know, how good is it? And what does it matter? You know, and uh, things can matter a lot without being very good. And things can be wonderfully good and not matter very much. Right, right. Uh, so, like you said, this has been a, <laughs> quite a year for you, even before it proved to be quite a year for for the rest of us. One friend just wrote to me and said that he, after I got all of that praise for my death essay, suddenly everybody in the world is under the threat, and that that must piss me off a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no. Has... Has all that changed your way of thinking about what you do or looking at the world? Oh, gee, it's tremendous effect. I mean, being conscious of death and having come to terms with it. I'm still on terms with it. You know, I, I worked that through. And uh, it doesn't bother me. Whenever you, you can admit to in yourself, you can then immediately see in the world. You know, is there's a kind of gravitas, the kind of seriousness that is 
invested in Velasquez Las Meninas that it didn't occur to me. I mean, because it, you know, because it's so great, but uh, that being in this situation woke me up to it. And I mean, the old masters. I mean, you know, why are they old? I mean, you know, why haven't we used them up after you know centuries? It's because because uh, we're still not there yet. I mean, we're not where they were yet, and uh, they're waiting for us up ahead. That seems like as fine a place as any to end our conversation today. Thank you so much, Peter, for taking the time to talk to me. It really has been a tremendous pleasure. Thanks, Ben. It's been fun. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It'll help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Tim Schneider and Caroline Goldstein and edited by Nick Long. Thanks for listening and see you next week.